Okay, so why don't we get started here and talk about MR of the bones and inflammatory disease of the uh, shoulder. So I don't remember who was last, but Ashley, why don't you take this one? Wow, um, so uh, this is a newborn. You can see there's extensive expansile, uh, I want to say lytic, changes to the bones, especially the upper extremities. Um, and it's also, I think it involves mostly the humerus, but also parts of the scapula. Yeah. So we'll talk about, let's go on to bone trauma. And uh, let's see, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? Soccer victory. All right, so acute shoulder pain while lifting his arms, which is unusual. Um, I see a cystic structure extending in the region of the subscapularis, and I'm not sure if that's disruption of the anterior capsule or tearing of the subscapularis. Um, I guess it could also be a tear of the superior glenohumeral ligament. Yeah, I think this is just uh, the patient has a large joint space, probably because of chronic degenerative disease and chronic effusions with this grade four chondromalacia. But he also has this little thing right here. So I wonder if this could be like um, Ehler Stanlos when they're hyper flexible and hyper mobile. That, 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 that's a good thought. Uh, but here we, we see this. What do you think this is? Well, what does it look? Well, if you saw that in the knee, what would you call it? A plica? Uh, well, this might be a plica. It doesn't look like a plica. This, this has place, all around it. These this placed chondral fragment. Okay. And if we look elsewhere, what do you see here? Okay. So here we can see that there is a chondral defect um, along the superior humeral head. Yep. Yeah. And so I guess it's displaced chondral fragment. So it has abnormal cartilage here before with some degenerative subchondral cysts. So he's got abnormal disease. And then when he raised his arms, he just knocked off a chunk of cartilage like we've seen in the, in the knees. Uh, so that's just a, an acute uh, uh, chondral injury. Uh, Michael. Six-year-old male with right shoulder pain for three months after hockey injury. Uh, it looks like there's, is this for arthrogram? Because it looks like there's a needle being placed inferiorly. Um, so what's happening up there is there's kind of irregularity and lucency of the distal clavicle. So you're worrying about osteolysis. And, and so you have marked edema in the distal clavicle with irregular cortical borders, and there's also capsular thickening. So what are you thinking about? Also thinking like distal clavicular osteolysis. Okay. Secondary to. So yeah, and you can definitely see that the right side is abnormal compared to the left. Um, well, you see it in like weightlifters, you know, chronic repetitive trauma. Um, so it's actually trauma. Yeah. Actually the I mean, that's the distal clavicle, and then you get the bone resorption because you keep irritating and you don't allow it to heal, and you end up with separation here. Uh, so this is uh, post-traumatic osteolysis. Good. Um, so this is a 51-year-old male, uh, one week after a bike accident with pain radiating to the left arm, and we're looking at the um, sternoclavicular joint, and it looks like there's separation there and some fluid. Looks like a good, looks like some injury, and there's a little bit of edema surrounding it, and 
separation there. This is a first, yeah. It's definitely separated there. External. When you do these uh, sternoclavicular or uh, our sternum rib uh, images, uh, one thing if you notice here, this patient is prone. And the reason that I like to do it prone is that these people are going to be breathing, you hope. If they're not, you've got bigger problems. Uh, but so you don't want the front to move. And so this decreases motion artifact. If they're on their back, then when they breathe, it's going to go up and down up here, and you're going to get much more motion artifact. So when you're looking for pectoralis tears, anything in the anterior chest wall, scan them in the prone position, and you'll get much better image quality. Okay. Uh, Jennifer. All right, so we have a 34-year-old male three weeks after soccer injury, and we have two coronal images through the sternoclavicular joints, and there's fluid signal intensity and soft tissue edema along within the right sternoclavicular joint, um, extending beneath the clavicle, and some edema within the adjacent sternum. Um, so this is compatible with injury of the sternoclavicular joint. Right, and this one is also extending into the first rib uh, sternal joint as well right here, which this is the normal on the left side, and here you can see the uh, the fractures really primarily going through the cartilaginous uh, articulation of the uh, sternum and first rib. And then you can see the, the trabecular contusion involving the sternum itself. And this is an area that just can often be quite painful. And here's just the axial images going through that same area. Okay. Painful for a long time. Uh, yes. I've, uh, we'll show it ex a case that I've had personal experience with. 46 year old male sternoclavicular pain, six months after trauma. So you can see that there's a lot of edema in that proximal aspect of the left clavicle, and it looks like there's probably separation, like to, kind of like at least partial dislocation of the sternoclavicular joint with significant surrounding edema capsular thickening. And then we need to look at the posterior vasculature just to make sure, you know, I don't see anything obvious, like there's no big like metastinal hematoma or anything. Yeah. So the, the axial images are important because even though it's rare, it's only 5 or 10% of sternoclavicular injuries, uh, if you have a, a posterior displacement of the uh, medial sternum or I mean clavicle or ribs at the time of the uh, injury, you can injure the, uh, the the vessels here, and that gives you much more uh, much more significant problems. So, uh, as you just pointed out, be sure and carefully look at the mediastinal structures uh, when you're looking at these kind of injuries. Uh, um, no, no, no. Most of the time, they won't get that nice. If they have uh, if, if you need to do surgery and due to displacement, uh, this is a miserable place to operate on. Yeah. Um, and, and you have to use wires for the most part, although there are some screws that can be used nowadays. It's, uh, it, 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 this is kind of a scary spot, and you might even think about a thoracic surgeon to be available. So we have a 22-year-old female uh, medical student with one-year history of left interior neck pain and background of eczema. Um, left interior neck pain. So on the right side here, we can see some separation of that. I think there's some separation of the sternoclavicular joint there on the right side. Yeah, I thought. Oh. Here, this is, this is the sternum. Okay. The medial aspect of the uh, clavicle, and we can see a nice sharp edge here, which is normal. Here we're not. Uh, the, the, the edge of the uh, clavicle is irregular, isn't it? Uh, Medial, medially on the left side. Over here. Uh, and the joint, John. Right, right, right there, yeah. Yes. It's kind of um, uh, osteoporotic and yeah, well, but what we certainly not not normal like on the on the right side. Yeah, we certainly don't see a nice sharp margin 
of the medial aspects of the clavicle here, and we see a little, a little bit of increased density here. This is normal over here. This shows increased density, and you can see the asymmetry here, the increased density of the medial clavicle, which is uh, commonly associated with this, this condition. Here's the MRI. All right. Okay, so we have um, some subchondral erosion. I guess it's all kind of some soft tissue thickening of that left clavicle. It looks sep that actually looks separated then. Looks low signal throughout. Um, I don't know what those two arrows are pointing. Uh, right there at the first. Okay, so a little bit of low signal there within the, the sternum. The PD fat set showing high cervical intensity. There, yeah. And then, some, again, an increased soft tissue thickening near that uh, proximal left clavicle. And some increased edema there. Um, oh, some post, this is post contrast imaging. You see enhancement at the costochondral junctions and the sternoclavicular junction. I don't know. Um, no trauma. Um, looks like just subchondral erosion. Oh, okay, scaph. Yeah. So, the things to think about here are really a psoriatic arthritis or the SAFO syndrome. Uh, synovitis, acne, postulosis, hypostosis, and osteitis. And we'll, we'll talk more about that uh, when we get to inflammatory diseases uh, later. Uh, but, uh, you know, j just think that you can have. Uh, uh, osteitis of the uh, sternum, and uh, it, you can get pain in the sternum, chronic pain from trauma, but if you don't have trauma, you really have to look and make sure they don't have a systemic inflammatory disease. And these are the two that are most commonly associated with uh, uh, inflammatory changes of the, uh, of the sternum. Okay, Jennifer. All right, so we have a 50-year-old female with right-sided chest pain, no history of trauma, and no history of smoking. Um, there is some slight eventration of the right hemidiaphragm compared to the left. Um, all right. I guess we're also seeing some sclerosis there along the medial aspect of the right clavicle. And here again, we, all, we have some sclerosis or hyperostosis along the medial aspect of the clavicle. And I don't see any asymmetric, uh, maybe some slight asymmetric uptake. Yeah. Okay, here's the MR. Okay. So here we have some increased signal and. Here's the CT. Okay. And some increased sclerosis. Um, T1 and PD fat set. I'm not sure what this is. It looks like it does have some edema there along the medial clavicle. Here's a follow-up bone scan. Um, okay. So well, now it's on the other side. Well, that's just because it's flipped around. Oh, okay. Really good. Um, so, so, so this is... This is basically the process we've been talking about before. Some people call this condensing osteitis of the clavicle. Uh, I, I think these are uh, due to trauma to the uh, uh, sternoclavicular joint, uh, probably repetitive, uh, or it could be single, and then you get the healing of the bone where you get increased uh, uh, a repair of the trabecular bone, and you get basically, a, it's really kind of like a chronic uh, trabecular injury in this area. On CT and plain films, they can become very dense. In the past, people were concerned about tumors and then try to biopsy this area, and it's not a fun area to biopsy. Uh, but it's especially if it's symptom if it's if it's symptomatic, it's probably uh, 
this osteitis of the clavicle, which I think is probably a trabecular bone injury. So this is not associated with It can be associated with it. This, this, the difference would be uh, trauma versus uh, stapho or uh, psoriatic arthritis. That's, that's really the, the thing about it. And it, it can be idiopathic as well. And you can get periosteal change. And here is. Can it be some kind of a neuropathy, John? Uh, I'm not aware of it being a neuropathy, but that's, that's, I think that's possible. Uh, I mean, like sympathetic, uh, but all that, that usually causes uh, osteoporosis. So yeah. forget I asked that. Yeah. And there's some other things that could, could be thought about, which we can see here. Uh, Tumors are an unlikely cause. And uh, if nothing else works, then you can uh, resect the medial clavicle. Well, that, that doesn't look like a tumor. No. Okay, uh, let's see. Jennifer, you did that one, right? Here I'm, here I'm telling you about tumors. <laughs> that's, that's, almost, that's almost funny. Seatac Airport in Seattle and was knocked down by one of those big electric cars that was carrying about three people. Um, so we see on the coronal uh, stir image that there is uh, edema in the sternal body and we see low signal on the sagittal T1. It's going to be probably a, either contusion, like a trabecular fracture, bone contusion. I don't see like a displaced fracture though. And it took her over a year uh, for the pain to go away. Yeah, she refused treatment by a very well-known orthopedic surgeon, and uh, other than uh, pain medication, so um, she suffered pain for a long time. Yeah. She, now, what the surgeon would have done is uh, quite unknown. Uh, but um, he would have done, probably injected it with xylocaine and uh, steroid. My favorite is um, uh, Depomedrol, or there are others. I, I know that patient. Uh, how is that patient doing, John? I had coffee with her on Saturday, and she's doing very well. Thank you. How was that, John? Uh, I had coffee with her on Saturday morning. Oh. She's doing very well. Thank you. Uh, that's good. Say hello sometime. Yeah, I, I don't see her often. She's my ex-wife. Um, all right, so this is a 20-year-old male with costochondral pain, and you can see... Um, some increased signal at the costochondral junction. I think the second rib there on the right. Yeah. And uh, it might be extending a little bit into the, the adjacent musculature, but I think it's just some edema there and it's more focal on the second rib there. And so is this costochondritis? <laughs> costochondritis, it can be called uh, you know, kind of uh, you know, partial tears. It's uh, also, if you, for people who think it's in primarily inflammatory, it's called TC syndrome. So the, the only difference is that they have positive inflammatory markers. But, uh, so I, I think you probably can get inflammatory disease as a cause of this, but I think the vast majority are post-traumatic or secondary. I, I think it's a, a trauma-induced because uh, I've suffered it uh, playing golf uh, over the years many, many times. Uh, it's a miserable condition. Yep. Yeah, and here they say the difference is where the paint radiates to. I'm not sure that's uh, and that's an 
a very reliable way to differentiate between two diseases. Well, if you, if, if you feel your chest, um, um, you'll find that it's a very sensitive area in the uh, uh, joints. Yeah. Um, Sternal clavicular uh, uh, joints, yeah. um, and 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 um, uh, uh, ribs. Yep. Good. Okay, let's go and talk a little bit about little league shoulder. So uh, <laughs> this just points out uh, none of you guys have kids in little league yet. Uh, but it's it's interesting phenomenon. Uh, so this just talks about, and I and I've, I've seen this multiple times with my kids, where there'll be a dispute out on the field, and the ref will start taking it, and parents will get into a fist fight over it, which is just crazy. Uh, but but we're going to talk about some of the things, and the reason I bring that up is that one of the significant problems in treating little leaguers is or the parents especially the fathers uh who uh, every father thinks that their kids is going to be the next uh, mickey mantle and or you guys probably don't know who mickey mantle was but uh, uh next great uh, baseball player and uh, uh they just won't take no for an answer and it can lead to a lot of injuries that we'll talk about okay so this is a classic paper in American Journal of Sports Medicine 1998 that shows the classical findings in Little League shoulder uh, on x-rays. What Little League shoulder is, it's uh, overuse syndrome of uh, teenagers uh, before the physis close. And it's really a Salter 1, uh, Salter Harris 1 fracture of the proximal humeral uh, epiphysis uh, which is not allowed to heal properly because they continue to re-injure it over time. So this is the normal side. This is the abnormal side. So what you see by x-rays is you get, uh, instead of having a nice sharp interface uh, of the bone on either side of the growth plate, you can see widening of the growth plate and marked irregularity of the, uh, of the bone here, primarily on the metaphyseal side. You can get little calcifications or fragments here as well, but it's this a widening and the irregularity of the margins, uh, which are in pain, uh, which are characteristic of a uh, little league shoulder, uh, which we can see there, the separation. And just remember in these, uh, this age group, the weakest link in the bones is the growth plate, and that's where you get failures. So, uh, so the, those are the findings you probably look on plain film, on MR, we, we actually have a number of other findings, and we can pick this up much earlier when it's first symptomatic. So this is a 16-year-old picture with shoulder pain. Here's PD fat sat. Uh, it would be hard to really, uh, uh, well, anyway, th there is the re irregularity. Uh, we did a study once where we imaged both shoulders, the, the non-throwing shoulder and the, and the throwing shoulder, and these kind of irregular pits, which we see along here on the metaphyseal side, you don't see in the non-throwing shoulder. Also, you can see that there is some edema here, which is a little bit difficult sometimes because with open growth plates, you can get a little bit of increased signal intensity in the metaphysis uh, normally, but this is more than normal, especially on the T2 fat set image. Uh, notice, however, on the T2 fat set image, because of the loss of signal to noise, and the difference in contrast, it's a lot more difficult to pick up these subtle findings within the bone itself. This is another reason why we stopped doing T2 fat suppressed images uh, because it was less sensitive to pick up a lot of these subtle uh, injury patterns that help us make the diagnosis. Um, uh, John, um, you can pick this uh, condition up on X-ray. Yeah, here it is. Right? Right here, yes. There it is right yeah. there. And uh, so uh, it's, it's uh, not necessary to get an MR on most of these uh, kids. At, at uh, this uh, you should, if you're going to get an MR, uh, you should get it of the parents' heads. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, at this stage, you're right. You don't need an MR to make the diagnosis. Uh, but 
at earlier stages, uh, we can we can pick up the abnormality earlier on an MR scan than you can on an X-ray. Yeah, I was talking with tongue in cheek. Right. Okay. Yeah, this is pretty big. I went went through some uh, uh, unusual incidents with these people, and uh, we used to lose a, a coach every year. Um, I won't say which high school I was a team doctor at. Uh, I was in college and and spent some time at UCLA and, and et cetera, um, do, doing sports medicine. And, um, and this age group is the worst um, um, to deal with uh, in terms of parents. Once the kids get into college, the, the parents usually don't pay that much attention. Yeah, I was wondering if, like, for little league or shoulder, if there's anything that's specific on, um, like, like, clinical findings, like an office. John, um, tendon, ten, tendonous. Uh, Is that what you're asking about? Some uh, findings. Yes, clinical findings. Yeah, clinical. It's tendonous and and a movement um, in in the extremes. Uh, they don't tolerate that. It's just like a, a regular fracture, uh, and uh, but uh, it's it's a, a more or less a stress fracture. Yeah, um, and it's like the calcific layer um, uh, of the physis. Great. So, uh, so, so that's uh, that's a little league sh uh, shoulder from uh, Denver. Uh, here we can see there's another 14-year-old who came in. I don't have plain films on this one. Uh, they were told to me that they were negative, but I never had a chance to see them. My guess is you probably, if you're looking, could pick this up on the plain film. But what we can see here is, a mark, again, mark that marked irregularity of the metaphyseal side of, of the growth plate with some edema within the growth plate. And here we have some edema within the epiphyseal region of the bone. Uh, so. And a little league player, as soon as you see this, uh, you, you just have to think of the little league shoulder overuse syndrome. The nice thing about these kids is that they heal very rapidly. So they can they can rest it for six to eight weeks and you'll get marked healing of the, of the growth plate. And here again, you can see that irregularity. See that irregularity that's typical of, of uh, the- I have, all, I have always used a sling um, and sometimes, uh, a, a swat. Okay. Um, and that um, two or three weeks is plenty. Have they found the incidence of this in in pictures? Uh, and, sure literally. Okay. So this is a 15 year old male with uh, right shoulder pain, throwing pain for two months, and we can see that there is diastasis at that growth plate, and there's some fragmentation. It's irregular. Um, right there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also displacement. Yeah, there's uh, there's a little bit of displacement. It's, it's in varus. Mm -hmm. I think, is, isn't it, John? Uh, probably. There's some rotation of it. Yeah. And you can see in the MR, there's quite a bit of fluid and separation. Yeah. This is, and, it, and this should never happen. Uh, that's the thing about it. Uh, this, this, this just should not happen. So here is a, that uh, patient with the, uh, the abnormal growth plate. They put the arm in a sling on 1-13-2012. On 3-28-2012, uh, ten, 10 weeks later, you can see that there's significant healing in the area of the uh, growth plate injury. So there are a lot of terms about this. This is just an overuse, really a sole. One thing, can you go back, John? Um, the thing about this healing is that it, the, the growth plate is closing. Yep. So uh, that, that this arm is not going to be as long as the other one. Yeah. Because this is a pretty early age uh, group. Uh, so that's uh, too bad. I don't think he's going to be much of a pitcher. Right. Yep. So it's just 
You gotta. Okay. So the, the radiographic findings, lateral physis widening, lateral metaphyseal fragmentation, demineralization of the bones adjacent to the physis. And I'll talk about MR findings in a minute. And uh, this is what the recommendations are in, uh, in South Korea. And there's just another example from Dr. Su. And we can again see this widening. Typically the widening is predominantly laterally like we see here and a lot of metaphyseal edema. Okay, now uh, let's see. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this patient? This is a, now a 20 year old. All right, so here we can see some irregularity of the lateral growth plate. It seems as though it's slightly downwardly displaced with respect to the medial aspect of the growth plate. And there's no significant surrounding edema. So I wonder if this could be chronic sequela of little league shoulder with premature closure of the well, growth plate laterally. He's 20, so, so it closed several years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a very good thought. Uh, the issue here, though, is more on the glenoid side on this particular patient. So uh, I, we're going beyond the little league shoulder again now. What you can <laughs> How about that uh, increased signal uh, of the head uh, medially, John? In through here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think that's abnormal. And, uh, that's a kiss lesion uh, due to the glenoid abnormality. And then here, you're right. And then here we can see the glenoid here. Yeah. And so th this is a chronic repetitive stress impaction stress injury. Uh, the subchondral bone of the glenoid, and I think John's right. I think this is probably some, so also some trabecular injury. The subchondral bone of the humerus banging against it, and this is due to repetitive glenoid impaction. Uh, and this typically occurs at an older age group than the uh, than the little league shoulders, and uh, it's from repetitive glenoid impaction. And again. Uh, this is something that should be taken seriously. These people should be taken out and allow this to heal. But again, uh, if you if you catch it before you actually have an impacted fracture, uh, this can heal quite readily, and they can continue to have a normal shoulder as long as it's recognized and treated properly. Uh, why don't we stop here, and we'll continue uh, with this idea uh, on Thursday. Okay. Well, you guys have a great Wednesday, and uh, 